G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for the review of the round 10 set of games. Not a great round as an Eagles fan, but there was still uh, plenty of interesting action that took place, a couple of thrillers uh, that are going to be quite significant, you'd think, uh, for shaping the, the final ladder at the end of the season. Some teams came out and made statements. So, as is the usual format, I will go through the uh, the nine games that took place on the weekend. Uh, acknowledging I did talk a little bit about the Eagles' embarrassing loss in Tasmania on a previous video, so if you're interested in my thoughts about having a bit of whinge about the Eagles specifically, there is that video. Before we crack into the action of today's video, guys, um, I do notice that about 44% of you who watch the videos have not actually subscribe to the channel which is fine but if you are enjoying the content and uh, you don't mind hitting subscribe you would actually be helping out the channel quite a lot from uh, an algorithm point of view so if you haven't already it would be great if you could take two seconds just to hit subscribe so round 10 kicked off with uh, probably Port Adelaide's best win for a number of years now and a bit of a, it felt like a bit of a coming of age moment for a team that uh, admittedly you know made a couple of prelims a couple of years ago had a down year last year but I think there's an element of coming of age for certainly a couple of stars in that particular team. We know Connor Rosie's kind of elevated himself to being, you know, an elite player over the last, you know, year or so. But in particular, it's Zach Butters, who, um, you know, every preseason I've been saying, oh, watch out for this guy. He is going to take the competition by storm. And in the last couple of years, I'm going, nope, nope. I'm not going to do it this year because he's. we've had to be a little bit patient with him. Aside from an important four points for a side that is now third on the ladder for Port Adelaide, Butters was almost the takeaway from this game and he's quickly elevated himself to being one of the best midfielders in the competition on current form. I think there was a stat that showed, you know, he started the year quite quietly in terms of coaches award votes, but after the first month, he's completely exploded. And that was before potentially a career best game from him with two goals and 41 possessions. He and Rosie in particular are very eye-catching. And it's ironic that it happened against Melbourne because I feel like potentially we're seeing the next Petrarca and Oliver combination. And Petrarca and Oliver are still very much prominent, but these guys are absolute stars. It also speaks to the maturity of this Port Adelaide side in a sense where all four of their tight games this year, which I think a tight game would be defined as under 10 points, they've won all four of those games. There was even a, a patch in the third term where I think the Demons kicked seven goals in that quarter, got out to a two or three goal lead, threatened to steal the game away from a Port Adelaide side that can be inconsistent historically, but they showed great resilience to come back and steal the win in a game that they absolutely deserve to win. The midfield battle was an interesting one here. Again, Melbourne boasts some of the best midfielders in the comp, but it was the young Port Adelaide guys, plus, you know, Ollie Wines, who's in that midfield as well. And they won the clearance battle 39 to 30, and the overall inside 50 count 61 to 48. So statistically, they were definitely the better side. Dan Houston was another prominent one for the power. He had something like 815 meters gained with his 33 possessions and a goal. And Petrarca and Oliver, as I said, were very consistently good. That's no surprise to us. I did notice Rivers and uh, May were pretty good in defense as well. But ultimately, they just weren't quite good enough to match it with Port Adelaide in tough conditions. It's a tough away trip, so these things do happen. But main takeaway is Port Adelaide, fantastic win. The next game is North Melbourne versus Sydney with the Swans getting up by three points at Marvel in a game that had a very, very controversial ending. I'm sure you've seen it, but if you haven't, essentially uh, the ball was deep in Sydney's forward line at a stoppage and the umpire ruled that North Melbourne had made one too many interchanges for the game. They hit 76 and therefore a free kick and 50 metre penalty was paid to the Swans and they kicked the goal from the goal square to ultimately win the game. It kind of got weird after that. I'm pretty sure North Melbourne, uh, I watched later, made a 77th interchange, which should have resulted in another free kick. I don't know, the whole thing got a bit bizarre. For the Swans, Luke Parker was arguably best on ground. He had a monstrous day in the midfield and Chad Warner as well was another player who really lifted in that last quarter. I think he had 11 last quarter touches and four inside 50s and the Swans ultimately got a much needed win to sort of keep their season alive, although that's probably being generous. It did come at a cost, however. Peter Laddams adds to this growing list of Sydney injured tours. He's done an ankle and I think uh, potentially is going to be put on the inactive list. For the Ruse, this was, uh, dare I say, it, an honourable loss in the sense that, yes, Sydney aren't a great side on current form and they've lost and that's disappointing, but they did have a number of young guns play really well in particular. Sheasel, who we already know is a gun, and George Wardlaw made his debut and looked really, really strong and athletic and skillful, really justifying that number four pick status. Um, he looks like an absolute gun. And then Bailey Scott also had his best game uh, for his career, actually, with uh, I think 33 touches and a goal for the Ruse. So strange game. Uh, Sydney will walk away from that 
out feeling a bit weird, kind of getting away with one a little bit, a little bit lucky circumstances. They may have won anyway, um, but they can breathe a bit of a sigh of relief because their season is kind of alive for one more week. Then we had the Western Bulldogs take on Adelaide down in Ballarat, and I was eagerly anticipating this game because I tipped the Crows as the upset uh, team to win this week. But unfortunately, I got that miserably wrong. The Bulldogs came out and made a statement. They've been on a really strong run of form lately, defensively very sound. I think in the last five games, the last five wins in a row that they've had, they've conceded an average of just 60.8 points. And you could really see the uh, influence of someone like a Liam Jones in this game and Ed Richards as well as having a fantastic season. The Dogs were just clearly the better side in this game. They've won seven of their eight last eight. They're on a good run of form, like I said. They had 100 more disposals, 13 more inside 50s, and probably should have won this game by more when you consider they were five goals, 13 at halftime. For the Crows, unfortunately, this arguably was their worst performance of the year, uh, coming off a big win against St Kilda. And in the last four, they've actually dropped three of those games and that one win against St Kilda is kind of sticking out. And they are a young upcoming side, but perhaps Perhaps I and others got a little bit excited about what they could achieve right now. It was a bit of a reality check. They're still a young upcoming side. It's not the end of the world, but uh, unfortunately, like I said, a reality check against a side that uh, is looking to establish themselves as a genuine top six team this year. Then we had another significant win in the context of the season. Fremantle surprisingly got up against Geelong. I say surprisingly, I didn't really give them a big chance in this game. And I was skeptical after the last couple of weeks that we'd really seen a huge improvement but when you consider they'd beaten Hawthorne and Sydney, albeit their numbers did look a lot better, but they came out and made a statement in this game. Yes, Geelong are missing some soldiers. They got some significant outs. Dagerfield, De Koning, the Henry brothers, uh, Gary Rowan, Jack Bowes, but not taking away anything from Fremantle. I think there's a lot of positive signs from them, and this was a reasonably good standard of football game. Brayshaw and Sarong were again guns in the midfield as they typically are, and Fremantle actually had 107 more disposals, so just got their hands on the footy a lot more than Geelong did. And the interesting thing about Fremantle is despite it not going as well to the eye test this year, their ability to generate scores, which is a question mark I've had on them for a little while now, has definitely improved this year. In 10 games, they've hit the 100 mark five times. For context, I read that between 2020 and 2022, they did that five times in total. So what we're seeing there is an evolution of Fremantle's weakness to hit the scoreboard has really come on. And in no small part, I think to the inclusion of Jai Amos, who is looking increasingly like an absolute gun, justifying that uh, pick eight select election back in 2021. He kicked three goals in this game and he's kicked 16 from nine this year, which is uh, absolutely as much as you can ask for for a young developing key forward. There were times where the Cats threatened to overpower Fremantle in this game. I think there was a big third quarter surge, but Fremantle flicked the switch in the last quarter held Geelong scoreless. So funnily enough now, even though Geelong looked great a few weeks ago and Fremantle didn't, these guys are now level on premiership points with just percentage dividing them. Then we had the Q clash and I was anticipating a closer Q clash than we're accustomed to. And I do think the game played out that way for about three quarters before the Lions being the much more strong and mature side overpowered them to win by 43 points. The margin was only 11 points at three quarter time and the Lions enjoyed a six goal to one final term, largely off the back of Lockie Neal. He had 35 touches and 10 clearances. He won the medal. Big shock there, Lockie Neal being one of the best on the field. Ashcroft had 30 touches and a goal and I think six clearances. He had a continued demonstration of uh, him growing in confidence as time goes on. But Josh Dunkley was arguably just as pivotal in the midfield. He had 29 touches himself and kind of did a two-way role on Matthew Rowell and kept him to a pretty quiet game. I think Rowell had like uh, 18 touches and just the three clearances. The Suns are a relatively strong clearance side and the numbers would suggest that. I think the clearances were just about even, uh, but the lines and their transition were a lot more strong as we've come to expect. And they had uh, 21 more inside 50s, which does show the difference in class between these two sides. On the plus side for the Suns, Bailey Humphrey stood up and probably had his best game at the level with 26 touches, 617 meters gained, uh, seven inside 50s and five clearances. So that's a fantastic performance for a first year player. And not just a first year player, a first year player that is primarily a forward who is looking to develop into a midfield in time. Those are fantastic numbers. Then we had the Dreamtime game and probably one of the best Dreamtime finishes that I have seen uh, in a number of years as obviously Richmond's been fantastic over the years and uh, Essendon not so much. But I had faith in Essendon winning this game. There was a huge temptation to tip Richmond because they're, big, they're good in these big clashes. They've beaten Geelong recently 
but I had faith that Essendon, after having a tough run of fixtures and losing their last four, I still had some faith that there's a good side underneath, and uh, they repaid that faith with a dramatic one-point win. Sam Durham kicks a goal in the goal square with seven seconds to go, and the Dons get some reward for effort. It's an interesting one to assess from a Richmond point of view. Uh, they led this game for 77 minutes compared to Essendon's just 17 minutes, and ultimately coughed up the lead in the dying stages. There's a stat going on around them uh, now, so I think in their last 12 close games, I think dates back to that uh, famous Kennedy late goal to beat them at Optus Stadium. In that time, there's been 12 close games. They've lost 10 of them and they've drawn two of them. So for whatever reason, this Richmond side's ability to win these close games, it's diminishing over time. But, you know, I think Essendon are a good side this year. Uh, Merritt was fantastic in this game with 39 touches, five clearances. And Essendon really got a hold of that chip mark style of play. Where I think they recorded something like 154 marks, which is crazy. For the Tigers, it's a disappointing loss just when they look to get some momentum on their side. Um, Taranto and Bolton were arguably the, the best two players on the field for them. But they walk away from this game with a missed opportunity and uh, kind of leaves them in no man's land for this season right now. Then we have the blockbuster clash between Hawthorne and West Coast down in uh, Tasmania. Uh, as I said, I've done some detailed thoughts on this game from a West Coast perspective, but I didn't really touch on Hawthorne in that video. So just some comments on them. To some extent, you know, it is a big surprise that West Coast lost to the 18th ranked side in the competition. But I do think this game demonstrates Hawthorne's ability to really fire when they do fire. And that's something that I was aware of going into this game. Of course, never anticipated a 116 point victory. That's insane. But one thing they do have is the ability to punish teams, which is good for a young and developing side. And clearly demonstrating themselves as levels above West Coast and even North Melbourne right now. They're a young side. They're still going to be a little bit Jekyll and Hyde, but we know that their best football is pretty good. James Sicily was probably best on ground for him. Uh, Mitch Lewis had 24 touches and six goals. But the, probably the biggest interesting takeaway from this game was the form of Josh Weddle, who... If you remember, they did this big audacious uh, live trade in the draft last year to secure him, probably overpaid from most people's perspective because Josh Weddle was a bit of a speculative third tall defender. They highlighted him as a potential midfielder. He's coming to this game. He's had 28 possessions and two goals. So finally, Hawthorne might have this big body midfielder to complement the other mids that they have in that side at the moment. And if he comes on, that is a scary prospect in terms of the mix that Hawthorne have there. But they might be out of the Harley Reid race, or at least in terms of getting pick one this year, but they probably do have the trade collateral to trade up for him if they want to. Then we had Carlton versus Collingwood, which uh, didn't quite live up to the magic of last year's um, breathtaking round 23 game with Collingwood pretty much winning the game in the first quarter of this game with five goals out of six. They pretty much kept Carlton at arm's length throughout this game and the win was largely engineered by uh, Darcy Moore was the best on the field by, by a long stretch. He had 25 disposals and he broke the record for intercept marks with 11 in this game. Bobby Hill was another one who kicked three first half goals and Majacek kicked four himself and Collingwood were just the class above in this game. The Blues now really need to staunch the bleeding and yes they've come up against the best side in the competition but some of their issues are kind of concerning when you consider they had more possessions, more clearance in this in this game. They leveled inside 50s, but it was jarring the difference between these two sides going inside 50. Collingwood was so much more clean, and the Blues had this tendency to turn the ball over. To kick seven goals, 15 as well. It's a poor result with the forward line that they do have, and they only had three individual goal kickers. Again, they can probably shake this loss off when you consider Collingwood may go on to win the Premiership this year, but losing five of their last six in a year where they really are playing for the here and now, trying to go as high up the ladder as they possibly can. They need to fix some of these warning signs. Then the final game of the round was a pretty good one, actually, between the Giants and St Kilda in Sydney in pretty tough conditions. I think the ground was a bit rough. There was divots around. There was players losing their feet left, right, and center. Uh, but it was a mature win that saw St Kilda win by 10 points in the end. Their forward line fired. It was the much-anticipated return of Max King. He kicked a goal early and went on to kick four, which is a great result uh, considering he's coming off a long-term injury. The other forwards fired as well. The Smalls and Higgins, he kicked three. Butler and Gresham kicked two. Jack Sinclair was fantastic off the half back line with 37 touches and a couple of goals as well. Unfortunately, it has come at the cost of a potential concussion to Machido Owens. Um, hopefully he's all right because concussions absolutely suck. But for the Giants, uh, dare I say it again to use this uh, overused term, but it was probably an honorable loss considering St. Kilda a fifth on the ladder right now. And the Giants really made him work for it. The midfielders got to work, you know, Cornelio, Kelly and Tom Green. They won the stoppage battle. Uh, but ultimately, St Kilda was better at making use of their opportunities. Toby Green came back in and kicked two goals, and Brent Daniels also had a good game with 23 and 2. 
Another player that continues to tease is Jesse Hogan. It's hard to believe he's 28 now. Kicked a couple of goals and I think still has the ingredients to be a great player. But for the Giants to really step up and win these games, they need someone like a Hogan to convert those two goals into four, which is pretty superficial arithmetic, obviously, that would put them in front in this game. But my point being, he has the potential to be a very, very good footballer. And I'm hoping to see it at the Giants. But that's it, guys. Those are my thoughts on round 10. Let me know in the comments what you agree with, what you disagree with. It was a revealing round, uh, plenty of even contests where certain teams may have legitimized themselves this season. You know, I think Fremantle and Port Adelaide in particular are two examples of that. And Hawthorne as well, you could say, certainly lifted themselves up above you know the other teams we're considering for the wooden spoon at the moment. And in particular, I'm talking about West Coast. We suck. But anyway, guys, hope you're enjoying the content. Stay tuned for my tips later this week. I've got uh, a plan for uh, a whole heap of videos this week because I am going on holiday um, at the end of the week. But we'll, I'll tell you more about that in another video. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.